Hey, it's Andy here. And before we get to the show, you know it's Thanksgiving this week, and I know I'm grateful, and we're all grateful here at the CFTC for you, the listeners out there. Uh, so really a heartfelt thanks to to everyone. Uh, it, it's been a great experience for us to create this show and, and really humbling to know that, that you found it useful and that you continue to listen. We're now at over 72,000 downloads with listeners in over 90 countries. So uh, thank you again. It's It's really been great. And I hope we've been meeting your expectations for bringing great guests on. You know, our goal has always been to bring on people with – uh, deep skill sets and, and knowledge about the markets we regulate to, to really help the agency make better informed decisions about policy and really to help educate the public on these issues by sharing this information and, and really sharing it in a format that's accessible, a podcast. So thank you again. It's been a blast to have you on this ride for this year. I hope you all have a great Thanksgiving. So stay tuned. Here comes the rest of the show. Welcome to CFTC Talks. I'm your host, Andy Bush, Chief Market Intelligence Officer for the CFTC. Just a quick reminder, as always, there's a disclaimer at the end of the show that's important for you to hear. A few weeks back, the CFTC held its first ever fintech conference at our offices in DC. Now, the event covered a wide range of areas in technology, from crypto asset markets to scams, fraud, and education in a digital world. And we had great guests on and participate from people like Felix Hufeld, who is the president of the German Federal Financial Supervisory Authority, or BaFin, to Tim Estes from Digital Reasoning, to Joel Minton from Google. Now, if you didn't attend, you can watch all of it by going to our website and clicking on FinTech Forward. One of the people who attended and presented is our next guest. Andre McGregor is a partner at TLDR, a global advisory firm that specializes in building companies and infrastructure for the new token economy. Now, he is a former FBI cybersecurity special agent and led the cybersecurity team at Tanium, a multinational cybersecurity software company. Andre, welcome to CFTC Talks. Thank you for having me. Hey, before we get to what you're doing now, let's talk a little bit about your background because it's kind of fascinating and pretty cool. Um, you worked at the FBI as a technically trained cyber special agent in New York City, and I think your focus was uh, nation-state intrusions, which I think you must be spending a lot of time chasing around uh, China and Iranian threats. Is, is that right? Yeah, that, that's correct. So, um, you know, I, I got recruited into the Bureau, uh, did my, my time at Quantico, and when I got out, um, uh, all new agents uh, that get assigned to Manhattan work counterterrorism for a little bit, and then I, I did a bit of uh, surveillance, Italian organized crime, and then um, at the time they were looking to build a squad that dealt with China hacking U.S. systems, and so they pulled a bunch of us that had uh, technology backgrounds, uh, and then gave us China, and we we worked a lot of the intrusions into the banks that were happening in New York, because most financial institutions either have a headquarters or made a presence in, in New York City, and then Iran with the DDoS thing that was happening uh, there and hacked the water dam. So uh, that was uh, an investigation that, that I got to be the case agent on, uh, on top of just, you know, critical infrastructure needs that were there. So, you know, it was very a very good time to be a cyber agent because we were defining the, the landscape every day. Well, how does that shape your views for today? I mean, it, it, there's there's so much going on in the cyberspace, but um, what a great place to kind of get started for you. How, so I, I guess the question is, you know, how does that shape your mindset looking at today? So, it, you know, it's, it, it's, it's weird for me to say, but, you know, I, I, I got when I when I got into, you know, working in IT and, and before, um, you know, the FBI was in the private sector, uh, I didn't really have a respect or the respect that I should have for cybersecurity because I was about availability and, and keeping systems up and keeping, you know, users working. Um, but then when you start seeing the attacks that are happening, uh, feeling like you have, you know, no recourse, you know, no one to arrest, especially if it's not someone in the United States, um, your data has been copied. And so now you're not even going to be able to get it back. Um, you may lose your intellectual property. Um, all of that is very impactful for the largest of companies all the way down to the, the single individual uh, that, that loses $2,000. And so when you look at that, you real, I, the thing I realized over time was that 
every country hacks. Yes, you know, the United States hacks as well, um, you know, for, for nation or for national security purposes, but still hacking nonetheless. And, and, you know, when you look at a country like Uganda, uh, they just, you know, not, not too long ago added, you know, $300,000 to the budget for, uh, cyber intelligence, which, uh, can be translated into hacking. Uh, every country <laughs> has a, has a reason to understand their neighbors or, and then, then translate that over to the criminals. Um, there's money to be had. And because of that, uh, it's just easier to, attack someone remotely than it is to, to rob a store, rob a bank, or break into a house. Yeah, as a friend of mine in the cyber uh, security business once said, you know, it, cyber secure, or cyber hacking or hacking is, that generates about a trillion and a half dollars a year, right? That's a lot of R&D. <laughs> <laughs> it's, also, it's also very asymmetrical. So, I mean, uh, you know, whether it's, whether it's hacking for financial gain or, or, gain or even cyber warfare, I don't have to put, you know, uh, risk of, uh, of death or, or injury. I don't mm. have to put lots of bodies on the ground to do uh, any type of activity that um, could be manpower intensive. I can spend $1,500 on, on a set of malware tools with an old, you know, Dell laptop and accomplish the same, uh, if not more, uh, with little risk than if I were to actually try to have an Ocean's Eleven style crew, you know, break into something similar. Right. And, and I think, you know, I was just listening to uh, CSIS. They, there was a roundtable discussion um, with uh, three women that were in the, in, in the space as well. And one of the things they were talking about, and I don't want to get too far off topic here, but was just what do nation states do now when they are hacked, when, when they are attacked? It, 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 you know, what are the decisions they have to make about how that escalates up? And and I think that's what's really challenging uh, to some extent about the world that we exist in now. So it, it, it is a really fascinating space. But I want to get to what you're doing right now, Andre. What is your role at TLDR? So I, I lead up our security practice uh, at TLDR, uh, specifically in, in the blockchain space. So uh, working with startups, exchanges, uh, partners in the space to ensure that they're uh, properly secure, hardened, have uh, assessments and audit capabilities to help them out. And then most recently, all of that is sort of stemmed into uh, how do we better do, you know, uh, digital asset custody. So right. we've uh, spun off another business that's specifically dealing with uh, setting up institutional custody uh, solutions and software. Well, you know, it's interesting because that certainly in the digital space is one of the most challenging components, um, being able to keep assets, virtual assets safe. And I, I got to say, you know, in the intro, which you didn't hear, but um, <laughs> you you uh, spoke at the uh, CFTC's first fintech conference and, and you did a great presentation on safeguarding assets uh, in this space, in the digital world. And, and I think, as, as you mentioned, you know, this is utmost importance for clearinghouses, exchanges, and intermediaries. And holding these assets creates, you know, a range of new system safeguards and custody, uh, custody challenges uh, for these entities. So, so for our audience, may, maybe you could level set. Start off by talking about hacks. You know, in the crypto space, this seems like these are just always in the headlines. Uh, it, it, it seems that that is one of the most consistent things that goes on in the space is that somebody's getting hacked. Yeah, no, I mean, you know, uh, I, I think, um, you know, it, it's kind of slowed down a little bit uh, in terms of what's been in the news, which is a good thing, or uh, it's also possible that we're just not seeing as many people reporting it uh, as openly anymore. And we started to see the same actually with financial institutions getting hacked back in 2009 to 2012. You, you know, it seemed like every, every week there was another institution that was getting hacked and now you don't really hear about it anymore. And trust me, all those banks are getting hacked all the time. It's just to what extent are they actually getting to anything important? And I, I and I think, you know, that's, 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 you know, good that we're, we're not seeing as much, uh, fervor around that anymore. But, you know, I will say that, you know, we, we have a instant response function within the team. I get a call still once a week. Actually today had, have, have someone, reach out from a, a private equity fund that just got hacked uh, in dealing with that. So it, 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 you know, may not make it to the news, but it's still, it's still there. Um, you know, when you look at it, sort of like these hacks, you know, why are they happening? Uh, Willie Sutton, who's a, a famous bank robber, uh, he said, you know, he was asked, you know, why do he robs banks? And he says, that's because that's where the money's at. Um, it's, it's that simple. You know, there's this easy, easy money to be stolen 
in this space until we get more and more people educated on, on security. And that's kind of the problem we have on hypergrowth is that when you actually have a hypergrowth industry and hypergrowth companies, uh, the need for keeping things available uh, is definitely in conflict with the ideas around confidentiality and integrity when you look at the, the, the triad of security, which we call CIA, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. That's... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is really interesting. That, you, that yeah, I mean, because I remember back in two thousand nine to twelve, it seemed like there were there were big announcements by a lot of different groups um, that some were quite surprising about how uh, how they were hacked and how how much data was actually out there, how many people's uh, personal um, uh, PIIs were exp- uh, exposed and things like that. So um, now it doesn't seem to be as much, or maybe we're just. You know, we're just used to it, I suppose, to some extent. <laughs> you know, it's it's part I, of the space I, I, I that think we're getting into. That. Yeah, I think so. I, right, I think so. And one of the things that just totally cracked me up. So I, I I went back home after listening to you, and I started changing all of my passwords because at the conference you said, you know, if your password is less than eight characters, you've already been hacked. Bottom line. And so and so you said you need <laughs> you, to get to twelve li- characters. You were listening. I, I, I was. I appreciate that you were listening. I was. So I went back. Oh, I talked about. It, I'm like, all right, we got to get up to twelve. And of course, once you do that, then it's it's a pain in the you know behind because then you know you get all sorts of things that change with that. You got to remember it, but it's really important to do. I guess my question for you is is like, what's the most common entry point for for this type of hacking? Uh. It, you know, I'm sure every business person that's listening right now has been told, you know, spear phishing, phishing emails with malicious links and attachments are, you know, uh, compromised. Uh, that's the uh, compromisable vector into a network. It is still 100% true. Uh, 90% over 90% of attacks will still come from email. Why? Because it's a system that is open and available. So if you think about it from the business side, even the personal side, I have to communicate and yes, I'm going to have a social media presence. It could be LinkedIn, it could be Medium, it could be other lo- or other um, you know sources of, of information. But then someone needs to contact me, and I'm seeking that out. And so you know the bad guy knows that the bad guy can craft an email that is exactly what I'm looking for from the type of person that I would open. And then from there, I get on this machine. And my number one thing as an adversary is to move off of that machine because I know that if I'm trying to get into a bigger network that you could turn your laptop off and I lose access. So I'm going to find a server because companies don't restart servers. They, they just don't. And, and actually, the, the more critical the uh, server, the more likely it's out of date and uh, not patched. So it'll just make it a lot easier for me to find that server to sit on. And then from there, I spend my time doing recon until I find my high value target. It could be private keys. It could be data. And then I start exfiltrating that out. You make it sound so simple, Andre. <laughs> it, 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 weird, weirdly scary. enough, it, it, it is very simple. And, and actually, I would say the most poignant moment of me being a cyber special agent was the moment that I took an offensive um, hacking course. And, you know, it's, 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 it's white hat hacking, and it was a bunch of agents that took it. But it was actually creating the malicious attachment and the malicious link and doing what we call a reverse shell so I can actually control your computer from my machine and I can execute commands and I can, you know, zip files up remotely and send them out and hide in the, hide in the noise. Um, right. Once I started doing that, I realized, oh, wow, this is as easy as, you know, just turning on the computer and writing an email, like, I'm surprised that it's not happening more. But that was that aha moment that it's like, oh, we really need to get the message out. We really need to do better as cybersecurity uh, experts to make this uh, harder and raise the cost of the adversary so they can't get into systems. Well, let's shift over to the fertile ground of crypto. (laughs) What have been your assessments in the security lane here? Uh, I mean, we're... Luckily, you know, with the information that's out there, we're we're seeing some you know better practices uh, overall. I think we still have a problem with uh, encrypted systems. You know, some you know there's about fifty percent of people that actually encrypt their systems so that you know if their machine gets lost or stolen, someone can't just you know access the data that's on there. Uh, obviously, you know, when you're working in a, a remote environment and you're in hotels and on airplanes and coffee shops, you want to have VPN on your laptop. But you also want to have it on your mobile phone. Uh, I, I would, I would probably be correct in saying that most people do a significant amount of their work on their mobile phone or have a significant amount of access. But why would you, uh, you know, allow yourself to connect 
blindly to a Wi-Fi on your mobile phone, but, you know, use VPN on your laptop. You should be doing both. Um, and then also the idea of using a password manager, so it helps you out when you know that you only have to remember one 12 or 13 character password and the rest is handled by the password manager, but also attach a UBT uh, to it, some hardware token, so that it can't just be someone, you know, has that master password. They actually have to also have that something you have you know, hardware token. So these are things that are, you know, that are sort of really simple to do and, and, and people should be executing that, you know, today. Um, but for, for the most part, you know, you see people still are very fresh and new with, you know, dealing with, you know, digital assets. And in this case, the digital asset just happens to be worth, you know, tens if not hundreds of millions of dollars, uh, something that can just be stolen just like the you know, data that was stolen from uh, a database. Well, I mean, you mentioned phones, and I think that's a great uh, component of digital assets because so many people <laughs> have apps on their phones that they either trade uh, digital assets or they have their keys there. And, and you know, why don't you talk about wallets because it's tied to to some extent to that um, in, in the digital assets. How, do, how are most people or what do you see are the best practices for people securing their digital assets? Uh, so... I mean, the, right now, the, the best practice is, you know, cold offline storage because you're not connected to the Internet. Now, obviously, that creates a liquidity problem if you do, you know, trade. And so it's a, you know, sort of a balance act. And most companies and most people are putting about, you know, 90, 90 for 5 percent of their assets in, in cold storage. Uh, so it's just not accessible. And then the other, you know, 5 or 10 percent on the hot wallets or exchanges, so they can do that. Um, you know, there's the hardware wallets that are out there, um, you know, but unfortunately we're, we're kind of back in the wild, wild west. So, you, you know, you got stories of people who scrap the paper printouts and Polaroid cameras and, you know, all, all the other stuff that you, know, you sort of scratch your head and say, you know, what are we doing? <laughs> How do we kind of regress backwards? But, right. you know, being, <laughs> right. be, being offline, it, weirdly enough, is the, the safer way than sort of having a, a presence online that uh, could be hacked. Yeah, it's funny, isn't it? That you go to a physical asset again, away from digital asset, which was the whole point of having a digital asset. I think it, it is kind of amusing <laughs> to, to see that. And I, you know, and I think about this because um, it, one of the things that, that that appears to be missing in the space um, are insurance companies, uh, a, a, as far as um, being active in the asset space for custody. Maybe you could address that for the audience. Yeah, um, I mean. Uh, the, the long and the short of, of the insurance companies in the crypto space is that for the last five years, they've had a hard time tackling cybersecurity insur insurance and understanding how to actually insure a space um, with as much uh, digital volatility for them that they're that, than what they're used to. And so, um, you know, now you want to add cybersecurity concerns with a high, you know, value uh, stored commodity. And and that's just kind of blown their mind in terms of you know maybe we just are are, are not ready to to really get into the space and and, and throw too much money uh, and risk there uh, especially when you start thinking that um, you know even you know the entire insurance industry really you know couldn't cover the total you know two hundred billion market cap of of the the top coins out there right now so for them they kind of want to you know you know dip their toe into the water. Uh, they basically said, we're not going to insure hot wallets. You know, the fact that, you know, all the hacking in the news, the, the, the lack of, of security uh, standards, um, we're just not going to touch that. Uh, we'll do warm wallets. And, you know, that's really sort of, you know, you're, you're touching the Internet briefly just to um, broadcast your, your transaction on the blockchain. But outside of that, it, 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 it's, it's offline for the most part. We'll, we'll ensure that, but we'll ensure it to, you know, up to 50 million per occurrence. So that, that makes it kind of hard to, to really be competitive uh, for a lot, of, a lot of people wanting custody in the industrial space. And then the cold or what they call species marine coverage, which goes back to the 1600s and, you know, <laughs> commodities and blocks and, and bars of gold that are being shipped on, on ships. You know, this is something tangible that they can hold, they can touch. Uh, they're really only interested in putting about 500 million per occurrence if any thefts happen there. And really for them, they kind of break it down to, you know, cold storage for them is that, you know, it, it would take an Ocean's Eleven style break-in for someone to get access to that private key that's, you know, 
etched on a, a metal name plate or, or in a, a piece of paper in a safe deposit box. And for the warm wallet, it is the, you know, hey, the car on the road, you know, there's a lot of different things that could happen to in terms of an accident. Um, you know, so there's a lot of risk there. So we're just going to cut that by 10 by, by 10 X and, and that's the 50 million that's there total insurance tower ceilings is around 2 billion, so, which is still, you know, if you look at the 200 billion market cap, you know, 1% right. uh, of the market. It seems like that's, that's a, that's gotta be a pretty difficult barrier for institutional investors. Um, and, to looking at this market, because I think that's where so much of the interest is now. It's trying to figure out the entire ecosystem that's around these digital assets. And part of it is obviously is, is clearly custody. Part of it is, in, is whether or not they can have their um, assets insured. And, and since you can't, like if you're only insuring up to 1% of the market, then that's got to be somewhat of a barrier to entry for these investors. It, it is, um, and, and for them, it's you know, it, it's a you know, going to require a combination of, of institutions that just have balance sheets that can you know cover losses you know from a captive self insurance perspective. So, you know, if you're a large bank with two trillion uh, in liquid assets, you, you probably don't need insurance if you if you do have some sort of you know a smaller hack. Uh, for everyone else, you will need insurance, and and for that, you know. The insurance companies really have only given out major policies to to a half a dozen uh, different entities out there. A couple of the big names that we all know, and then a couple others. And um, but that that barrier to entry is really going to you know be the fact that either I want a qualified custodian that has a track record, uh, or I want to invest in a a, a startup or or a security team that's insured that has uh, the, the knowledge to to secure this because. You know, while there is a financial side to all of what we're doing in 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 digital asset custody, it's really mostly security and technology. It's you know how secure can I you know make the assets so that I avoid all the risks that that are coming my way, and then how do I have the technology to speed up transactions so I have a fast market liquidity uh, going on? Well. Let me shift gears on you and talk about some other risks uh, when it comes to the trading platforms. And and I think you're familiar with this, but um, w- we recently had on from the uh, New York State Attorney uh, General's office from the uh, in- Investor Protection Bureau, John Castiglione, uh, and to discuss their virtual markets initiative report. And, and at, at the end of the report, they ran down a list of concerns over crypto platforms. And I was just curious. Andre, from your perspective and in your space, did, did anything surprise you or, or did it confirm you that the risks that you were already aware of when that report came out? Um, it, it confirmed. So, I mean, the, the knowledge is there. So that, 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 that goes without saying. And, and having these reports are, are very helpful because people are looking for something to point to to be able to say, ah, I need to work around those particular needs or those particular standards. And, you know, I always look back on the cybersecurity days that up until NIST came out with the cybersecurity framework, you know, we were all sort of figuring out best practices um, on the fly and it was changing daily. And, you know, once that came out, even though it took iterations for it to, to be where it is today, there was a sigh of relief of like, okay, I have something I can look to, somewhere I can go. And so you, you get reports like this and, you know, what, you know, one of the sort of questions that you brought up is, you know, when you're looking at risk, you know, what insurance uh, or other policies are in place to make customers whole in the event of theft of virtual or fiat currency. I mean, you know, being that there's no, you know, FDIC, uh, you know, backing digital assets, uh, what's in place so that you can make customers whole again? You know, they, it brings up things of, you know, transparency with, um, you know, auditing and, and verification for, you know, virtual fiat accounts, also very important. Um, you know, and then, you know, even a couple of things that, you know, just stuck out for me is saying, let's change the language from offering two-factor authentication to requiring two-factor authentication. It's not an option. You know, if you look at some of the accounts that we have, brokerage accounts, um, you know, bank accounts, it's no longer an option to have a two-factor. It's required as well as the need for pen tests. You know, you, 
you want to, if you're building your own software, you want to have it pen tested before you go live. And then you want to have it pen tested with any new, new major features or any new major versions that, that are happening in software. And you want it to be independent too. So the, the, the pen test shouldn't be coming, you know, to the IT team and they can sort of hide or mask things that, um, really would be important for the CEO to know or for the, the board or the audit committee. These are things that, you know, need to be done, especially from an external company. Yeah, I like the idea of, of, of the default position being the two-factor uh, um, authentic, authentic, uh, to authenticate it, right? I mean, I, I think that it, it reminds me of the book called Nudge where, you know, if, if you um, give people the opportunity to invest when they're at a company, right, as far as, far as their 401k, if you, give them the, if you give them the opportunity to invest – Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. But if you make it the default position that 10% of their income goes in there, you know, it, it, all of a sudden people start saving a lot more money, right? <laughs> and it's the same thing, I, I mean, think, with I mean, security, right? The, the balance is always going to be the level of friction that you want to, that you don't want to impose. And so I get, and we all get why, you know, in the beginning, especially with websites, it was, hey, let's just, you know, let it so that people can log in so that they can, you know, do e-commerce so they can, you know, have the access to the data that they're looking for. But it's not useful if, the, if you lose that brand trust that you're, you're working towards and that reputation that, that you need. And so the balance is there, I think, the education has got to the point where people understand, you know, two-factor. But now, let's bring it to the next level. Let's bring it to multi-factor. Let's bring it to, you know, not only something you know, like a, a password or something you have, like a token, a hard, a UV key, but something you are, biometrics. You know, I, I, I bank right. with, USA, with USAA, and I can I, I have biometrics on my phone, both face ID and, and, and voice. Um, so these capabilities are out there. And, um, you know, hats off to Gary McAllen. I think he's one of the top uh, CISOs uh, of banks in the United States, and his security team is tops. And so, you know, if he's able to do it, I, I trust that others, you know, can do it too. And then you also want to do what we call uh, some where you are. So uh, geofencing, you know, if, if you only have customers that are in New York State, uh, and they should only be logging in from New York State, then why would you have access for anyone outside of New York State? You limit your threat landscape. If I all of a sudden say, hey, if you're outside the United States, you can't log in, which means now I've created another barrier, another cost for the adversary that's trying to hack in. Oh, I have to now come in through a computer in the U.S., which means I'm exposing myself a bit more. Maybe I won't come into your exchange or into your platform and I'll go somewhere else. These things, when you start adding them up and you require them versus making them optional, uh, is, you know, some little things that could be game changers for hacks. Well, before I let you go, um, I, I always like to ask people about, you know, staring into the future, what, what they're going to be up to for the next 12 months. And I know you're a super busy guy. You're, you're at a lot of conferences, but seriously, what are you going to be doing for the, like, what are the top three things you're going to focus on for the next 12 months? So, so the first is, um, you know, supporting government regulations and standards, uh, especially around security, uh, crypto uh, insurance and, and custody. So uh, I'm glad to be able to, to work uh, with the CFTC uh, on that. I'm working with other governments like the government of Bermuda to support that as well. And, and, and that, that, that's been, uh, you know, sort of top of mind from a, from a strategy perspective. Second is, uh, you know, bettering the ecosystem so that security is, is second nature for these blockchain companies and, and really, you know, giving them the tools and the expertise and the knowledge and, and the access to, to know that they can focus on, you know, building their business and staying secure. Uh, but really what's going to be dominating most of my time is that I'm, uh, me and my, my, my team are, uh, in the process of building, uh, institutional custody software and, uh, secure vaults for, uh, digital assets. And so, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm happy that, uh, we're, we feel comfortable with our team. We feel comfortable with our knowledge. We feel comfortable with others trust, trusting us, especially at the institution level that instead of advising people on, on what's the best custody solution, we're just going to build one and, and give them that option. So that's going to be probably the focus of my life for the next, uh, uh, six months, definitely before we go live. Excellent. All right, partner and head of cybersecurity at TLDR, Andre McGregor. Thanks for coming on the show today. Thank you again. That's a wrap for me this week. I hope you enjoy your Thanksgiving and, and maybe get a little time off from work. We'll be back next week with more great guests. I'm Andy Bush, Chief Market Intelligence Officer for the CFTC. Thanks for listening. 
This has been CFTC Talks. But wait, we're not done yet. It's time for a disclaimer. The CFTC is providing this information as a public service, and it is neither a legal interpretation nor a statement of CFTC policy. Reference to any specific product, service, trademark, manufacturer, or service provider does not constitute an endorsement or recommendation by the CFTC. The CFTC is not liable to any consumer or any third party for any direct, indirect, incidental, consequential, special, or exemplary damages or lost profit related to the use of the information provided or referenced in this podcast. Selection of guests on the podcast does not imply an endorsement of any particular individual or entity. Many individuals and entities provide similar services to those of the guests. The views and opinions expressed by the guests in the podcast are their own and not specifically endorsed by the CFTC. Moreover, the information provided in this podcast should not be construed as investment advice. Consumers should rely on their own inquiries as to accuracy and relevance of the information incorporated or referenced in this podcast and assume the entire risk related to its use. The CFTC is providing its interpretation of market trends solely to inform the public of a framework for projecting possible outcomes under different scenarios. If you have any questions concerning the meaning or application of a particular law or rule administered by the CFTC, please consult an attorney. Thank you.